What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long with the Friendly Bear Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Kim Ann Curtin back on, back on the podcast. Uh, I had We had Kim Ann Curtin back uh, in the beginning, like one of the first 20 episodes of the podcast around this time last year. It's been almost a whole year, which is incredible. Time flies. Uh, but yeah, Kim, Kim Ann Curtin, this is uh, the Wall Street coach. So Kim, there's a lot of coaching throughout wall street she's been through she's had some legendary um clients and people associated with, like that she's written about and been part of her book the wall look at that the wall, transforming <laughs> wall street one yeah yeah she have she has it behind her also great book a lot of legendary people in there okay. um yeah good stuff and um yeah so i decided to reach reach out to the kim once again because i the, the last podcast one you know, it was, it was a great podcast and, uh, I'm a big fan of her, her podcast. And also when she was on the SETI trade podcast, That's you know, right. so That's yeah, right. so, so a lot of stuff out there on, on Kim. Yeah. And, and, uh, I encourage everyone to check it out. So with that being said, so Kim, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, doing well. I'm just another trading day and, um, another podcast day, you know? Just love it. I just love what I'm doing today. Oh, um, well, well, you know, I, I had, I had stuff to do in the middle of the day, which is kind of annoying because I'm the type of person, you know, a few years in now, I like to be at the trading desk the whole day. I know Mm -hmm. people don't like to be stuck glued to the screen, but I'm fine with it. And today I had a lot of errands to run. Uh, I went to go to the bank. I'm in downtown LA. So I had to like run, walk to the bank. That bank was full. I had to go to another bank. And then so, but I came back and I, and I executed a trade, <laughs> you know, it was, it was in and out of, you know, but like, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, I have a system going and went well, I managed to trade well, despite having so many things to do today. I'm so glad so, to hear it. Congrats. It's really yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. How about you? So, so you're in Hawaii and you're doing your podcast now. Maybe you want to talk about some of the guests you've had, like you, you were just telling me before the show started. Sure, sure. We were very lucky to secure Tom Sosnoff. He's the creator of Thinkorswim, sold it years ago. He had his platform is Tasty Trade uh, and Tasty Works. Uh, he also created the Small Exchange, which I think he also just sold. Um, but Tasty Trade itself is just an incredible platform. And he's just a legend. He's a former Chicago uh, floor trader. So he's been trading in the market for 40 years and in the podcast, you know, he just talks about some of the really important things that traders need to be aware of. He specializes in options, but he just has so much powerful wisdom. So uh, it was very exciting for me to have him say yes, you know, to my little podcast. Um, And we also had Jawad me on on recently. He's the author of Stray Reflections uh, and he's just you know, one of the top uh, macro, you know, he, he understands the macro like nobody else and advises some of the biggest hedge funds in the world around what's happening uh, in a lot of diverse, all the themes that matter to investors and traders. And his, he's just one of a kind, really very spiritual man. That's what really uh, spoke to me when I first learned of him. I watched his interview of Stevie Cohen, which was just so well done uh so i'm always wanting to develop myself and to learn from others and also to just see the people that i think are making a difference in the community for traders and for investors those who have been at the game for a long time also howard lins and i had him on uh probably almost a year ago we've just had some really great people come on to hopefully help educate and uh you know encourage those who are working as hard as you are and your listeners so. absolutely yeah uh one that stands out also is, is the early one that you had with matthew mcgonaghy yeah that matthew. one was really cool and then matthew. there was another one that you had um the guy with bernie madoff he caught he frank he, Casey. Uh, Frank. Yeah, Frank. That was yeah. an awesome podcast. That's an amazing yeah. podcast. Frank is one of the three gentlemen who helped bring Bernie Madoff down. And Frank was at the time looking to, you know, at the time, Bernie Madoff's fund was impossible to get into. 
And that was part of the shell game, if you will, a billion dollar shell game that Madoff had, where he became so, that was part of that, you know, when you look at anybody who creates a scam, right? Elizabeth uh, with Serrano's Holmes, right? You, you, there's so many scam like reality shows or documentaries now mm. out there. What you find they all have in common is that they appeal to this, uh, which we all, of course, are suckers for. We want to be part of a club. We want to be on that inner circle. And so part of what was tricky is that Madoff had people like, he'd make them come back to him over and over and over again before he said yes. And once that made you feel like he doesn't need my money. And so Frank ultimately was observing him and wanted to duplicate. Well, how is this guy's constantly going up? He, he never has he never goes down how is that possible so he was hoping to duplicate it for his own clients and brought uh it to harry markopoulos what he understood to possibly be his way of uh investing and uh markopoulos because of his experience he he's known as a forensic accountant he was able to instantly see that this was a fraud he's like this is a fraud and frank was like wait a minute you can't say that too loud because this guy is the guy like to be known as Bernie on a first name basis globally and everybody knew who you were talking about. That's a person that had a lot of power. And so Frank at that point was like, whoa, if this guy is a fraud. Then this could take down the entire infrastructure, all of finance, because yeah. this is it was it was so massive and the people involved the people invested from countries to sovereign wealth funds to individuals to pensions i mean a lot got wiped out so frank i he's one of the 50 featured in my book uh transforming wall street why because i was looking for men and women who were successful in finance, who had been able to succeed in the industry with integrity and with consciousness. And that's when I met Frank. I met Frank and I was so inspired and, and impressed because he really, I feel, took his life in his own hands by trying to blow the whistle on uh, Madoff because nobody was really paying attention. He was so powerful, had connections in so many high places that it just kept kind of being ignored. But it took them, I think, over eight, nine years to finally wow. get uh, the SET to listen and, and, and or different, you know, criminal bodies. But of course, they, they succeeded and Madoff finally got exposed. But, you know, it's just, I think part of that for me is the, I like to find the stories of the people who have moral uh, courage. And, and to be quite frank, thanks for bringing up Matthew McConaughey and having him on the podcast was also such a treat. And even though he's a movie star, I saw in his book, Green Lights, this moral courage you know, his self-awareness around the trappings of Hollywood is so heightened. He's so conscious to how he can't let himself get caught up in the accolades and get swollen in his ego. So he talks in Green Lights and he talks on my podcast about how when he gets an award when he gets all the accolades he will actually withdraw from hollywood and go take himself to a place where nobody knows who he is like he stayed at a little monastery where they really didn't have running water nobody really knew who he was he went to the amazon jungle um to just get himself back to center and remember that so much of that you know hyperbole that happens in places like hollywood can happen on wall street too is in is it everything like to come back to not being so focused on your ego but coming back to that still small voice within so i think i'm always looking for the people who succeed at that to encourage me to be able to do it you know mm -hmm. and then if you live it hopefully you can help other people live it too 
Absolutely. And uh, I think your book is, is, is very necessary. You know, it's like uh, conscious capitalism. It's like capitalism. It's like good capitalism. Yeah, I know. So uh, I come from an, I, I did a podcast recently with um, San Lucci's team. I don't know if you know San Lucci. Yeah, He's, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah I, w- I was in. If you're listening, his... Sang Luchi, I'm trying to have you on my podcast. Oh yeah, no, like, yeah. Yes. So he's in Puerto Rico. He's doing his own thing, but uh, but um, but yeah, we we were talking with um, a couple of the guys there. That was a Chicago exchange uh floor yeah. trader and another trade another options trader there. Because I come from a background in architecture, and there's very um few architects that are that were okay that I know that were like interested in trading at all that it could even have a conversation with trading because they they consider uh they're <laughs> like capitalism almost bad because a lot of architects i know are almost borderline social the, the socialist kind of mentality of, like capitalism is is the rich greedy and and uh you know that that's that view the, the bernie madoff kind of view instead yeah. of like uh, capitalism can be good as well, you know, not not crony that, capitalism. That's but why they- I'm so that that's why I think I was so shocked, you know, to find like I just wanted to find because I I felt like after that OA crisis and Madoff's arrest, it was all the bad guys getting print, right? The only yeah. ones that were in the spotlight were the bad guys, and that's why I wrote the book because I wanted to show the world there were yes, good ones. Exactly. Too. Exactly. Even but, you uh, had um, Bill Ackman on there, and a lot of times uh, Bill Ackman will get a bad rap. And uh, when you had him on there, uh, you well, know, he's in, every, the book. he's in the yes. book, and he talks about how he, you know, really stood up against Spitzer, who at the time we didn't realize Spitzer, as the Attorney General, had his own skeletons in his closet, but just the courage of him standing up for what he was in the midst of like you know i think spitzer at the time was looking politically to position himself to run for office and so a lot of times as we see in the fictionalized billions you know the the people sometimes who are law enforcement they have their own political uh yearnings and that motivates some of what the prosecution goes after you know but but david to go back to architecture I'm kind of shocked to hear you say that about architects because one of my all time favorite books is um, Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead. Yes. And, yeah. you know, the hard. So I, I almost went into architecture because of how much Rand's books influenced me and it impacted me. So I'm kind of surprised that you, you, yes. find a lot of you know, art. and that, that was part of our conversation we had because like, I'm like, what, you know, it's a shame because architects are very well cultured. You have to go on this path. Um, like for me, I, I got, had the chance to study under Frank Gehry. I don't know if you know who he yeah, is. He, of course yeah. I know him. And I, I loved his path. He, he kind of, but he went, you know, the artist route and like was kind of a rebel, uh, mm-hmm. The art community, the architecture community in general, for example, you you take out all these student loans, and then when the time you you graduate, you gotta you're the bottom guy in the totem pole, uh, working your way up for ten years, and you know you're gonna one hundred fifty thousand dollars is like for the majority is is the peak of like what you're gonna make with all this cultural knowledge and understanding about just everything in the world, you know. So architects are very kind of, a lot of times I think they're kind of bitter about that and watching someone make millions of dollars while they're like uh, super sophisticated and cultured and they're making a, I know because I was one of them, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah. but I, you know, I, I just, I, I never, and, you know, architects, for example, when you design a building is to make the world better. It's like uh, I, architects are big, like, for example, on social housing projects, like in Europe. And uh, that is just socialist housing, you know, it is what it is, you know, so and the EU will fund like these major big projects for, for like for the world to use. So, so architects to, to talk about trading and, and like capital towards trading to like and taking risk, heavy risk and all that. It's, it's just it it's a hard you know, it's it, it's hard for for my former colleagues that I, everyone I spoke to from grad school and. And from where I worked and stuff, it's just uh, they didn't really understand 
uh, I, because my I wanted to do I saw like um, I want to trade to get capital to to buy land or property and design and build my own stuff, which is kind of what Gary Gary in, in a way Gary did the same yeah something like that, but yeah. um but to talk about that with our architects and all you know it's just uh it's almost like a, when I use the word the word capital is almost like a dirty word wow you know Incredible. so it's like it's they like should read, they should read my book <laughs> yeah I think so how it can be done for for the good you know that it can I mean what I think Michael Porter he's uh at Harvard Business School he's like the world's expert on competition. And he talks about his own journey with capitalism and how he thought the nonprofit world was over here and capitalism was over there. And as he started to, he calls it shared value instead of conscious capitalism, he began to realize that businesses that did behave consciously, that took into account the stakes of the community, the stakes of the planet, the stakes of their employees, we're going to flourish. He, he said, it, it's just a no brainer. And, and I think part of the reason capitalism has really got a bad rap right now, it's really just in the last 30 years that this started to happen. And the reason is because there was a mistake made thanks to Milton Friedman and some of his colleagues misread that they are they misinterpret because they're economists, not lawyers, the uh, requirements that a business had to be run for shareholders. It, it actually legally isn't needing to be run for shareholders primarily. And that's how they interpreted, misinterpreted what that law said. And that's when business and so much of these insane salaries to CEOs, while their people at the bottom aren't even basically making a living wage, happened. And that, thanks to Lynn Stout, I learned in her book, Professor Lynn Stout, she was a former Cornell professor and an attorney, and she was the one who discovered this. And her book is called uh, The Shareholder Value Myth. Uh, such an important book, a very short book, 70 pages, 100 pages, but man, she nails it. And she also says that small business is going extinct. It used to last on average 70 to 80 years. Small business today lasts eight years. So we have all of these repercussions because of a mistake that's still being taught in business schools today, horrifically. And that is just part of what's kind of screwed business up and why we have companies like Enron misrepresenting with the books. Why? Because they they have to make sure that the shareholders they think because of that misinformation is who they're running their business for. That isn't, and they're not legally obligated uh, either. And that misinformation is part of why I think so many people have gotten a bad taste in their mouth about the way businesses, big business. Yes. Is yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and uh, I think people need to uh, read your book, you know, <laughs> so it's not so, capitalism's fault and it's not business fault. It's the structure that is needing to be changed. That's the heart of the matter. If, if capitalism is an exchange of fair value exchange, and that is what has kind of gotten washed away. And that's part of the research for my book was reading Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations and the book that preceded it, the umbrella it sits under, which is called uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And, you know, what the professor that I interviewed about Adam Smith said is that probably Adam Smith in today's context wouldn't even consider himself a capitalist because the way it's kind of being warped. So that's fascinating to hear. So sorry to go down that route. Good stuff. Probably so 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 Kim, what got you into this? Was were you always interested in this before coaching? Because you you okay, so you you got into coaching. Uh, you had this story, and maybe you can you can talk about it about nine eleven. You sat down the, in the. In it wasn't nine eleven. It was two thousand and eight crisis. Two thousand eight. Yeah, two thousand eight crisis. Wait, and this, uh, yeah, you you sat down and put like a sign up. And people, yeah. and that's when you started coaching. But then, were you always interested in Wall Street with the way you you talked about it, the conscious capitalism and all that before? And then coaching came, or 
I worked in finance. I worked in finance for almost 10 years before I started the coaching practice. And I went to work on Wall Street because of Jim Rogers' book, uh, Investment. Ah, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first finance book I ever read. And he talked about how he wanted to see, he was, you know, being cautioned against investing in Asia. And he was like, I want to see for myself. So he did this motorcycle tour across Asia and he saw democracy out on these out in the fields with the farmers. And he was like, okay, I know it's a communist regime, but I'm seeing democracy and dare he say, you know, another version of what he felt was worth investing in. So he didn't listen to what the crowd said, as he usually doesn't. He's very much of an uh, outlier, Jim Rogers. And he, that book, though, just first of all, I think I've always loved motorcycles and the concept of yeah. that. And just, wow, this man went and looked for himself. I like, I think I've always been a kind, the kind of person who wanted to be autonomous. I think Rand, Ayn Rand's books had a big impact on that. I sort of grew up in a family where the word, the royal we was used a lot, the word I, not so much. So Uh when I read her books, especially Anthem, uh, where that character's introduced the word I, it made me kind of have like, wow, what do I want to do? And I think a combination of Roger's books uh, and just the concept of being able to make more money than perhaps architecture or fashion, which were two paths that I almost took, uh, put me into that. I had a really, one of my family members was sick. I really needed to be a contribution financially. So I went into finance thinking that would be the place that I'd make the money. And then I, nine years in, hired a coach, had a transformative experience. Uh, and I really felt called to become a coach. So I went down that very long rabbit hole, got certified and was already coaching uh, before I sat outside the stock exchange. I had started my business a year prior, year and a half prior to that. So I started in 2006 and then uh, the OE crisis came. I was seeing uh, a decline in work because people stopped spending money right during the summer and fall of 08, it was it was clearly in the in the air, so to speak, mm-hmm. the crisis that was unfolding. And uh, a friend just said, look, if you're born to coach, you'll coach, uh, do it for free, do it at lunchtime, get a get a side gig uh, and just see what happens. And I thought it was crazy, but then I thought, what do I have to lose? And so I sat outside the stock exchange. Uh, on the day that the, the market wound up dropping like six 600 points, which at that time was quite catastrophic. And I just started coaching on this bench. I had a sign that said the coaches in and, you know, traders from the trading floor, bike messengers, secretaries, executives, anybody that walked by if that was stressed out enough, everybody was getting fired. So it was, you know, mass layoffs. They'd just be sitting down for 20 minutes and I'd just do speed coaching, speed coaching. And a reporter saw this and uh, wound up writing an article about me calling me the Wall Street coach. And then, you know, I went and trademarked it eventually. So that's how it all started. Awesome. And um, okay, so about coaching. So what's your favorite thing about coaching? And, And like, what has changed with coaching from like 2008 Till now, because like now you got all these retail traders like trading. Right. You know, technology has taken off, it, sure. and you. So, so what? What's changed in, in total? And like, what? Yeah. What's your favorite thing about it? Well, maybe what I'll talk about is what hasn't changed. What hasn't changed is that ultimately, uh, the human being who's trading or investing is still a person who needs to learn how to become as neutral as possible. And I think for my own journey, uh, learning how to not be triggered has been a big part of what I've had to do a lot of work around. So I think my favorite thing about coaching is being able to share all the tools I've gathered for my own healing, for my own freedom, for my own um, path of being unattached 
with those who are hungry for ways to do it themselves. So it's it's really fulfilling to be able to share tools that have worked for me with people uh, and and watch them be able to transform their lives and their trading because of it. Gotcha. And so why why do you, would someone want to go the coaching route as opposed to, you know, trying to figure it out on their own? Like, and yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think it's a matter of uh, speed. You know, it, you you can do it by yourself, but you can also swim upstream by yourself. It's going to be harder. Wouldn't it be better to swim downstream when the current's with you? Like, it, it's just a matter of where do you want to put your energy? And because I feel the culture we're living in, all of us, and because a lot of traders are men, there is this preset cultural expectation baked in to a lot of traders when they come into trading. And even the traders who are sophisticated, who have been here for a while, they're still up against it. Uh, whether it's just with their peers or, or other traders that they socialize with or spend time in the chat rooms with. I think part of what's hard about coaching yourself is that you can't really see yourself neutrally. You have blind spots and those blind spots, you know, it's, I listened to Tim Parker's, uh, he was just interviewed for the Traders for a Cause. And he said, none of us can ever see our blind spots. And I was shaking my head, listening to him, like, no kidding. We think we can, but we really can. So to have somebody outside of us listening to us makes a big difference. I, I have noticed that when somebody has no, I, the other thing about coaching is the coach doesn't set the agenda, the client does. That's a really unique relationship. Very, there's no relationship most people have in their life where the person holds their agenda for them unconditionally. I don't set the agenda, the client does. And I will hold them to that agenda they have told me they want for themselves, come hell or high water. The days that it's raining and they tell me they don't want to do X, Y, Z, I'm going to be like, too bad, mother blank, blank, blank. You're going to do this because you told me this is where you want to be at the end of this. To have somebody be able to neutrally hold you accountable to your own goals, it's powerful having experienced it myself. I first hired a coach before I became a coach and I saw how different everything unfolded because I felt heard. And when you hear, sometimes I would say something to my coach and she wouldn't even say anything. She would pause and I'd say, God, do I actually believe that? Like, where did that come from? I can't believe I just said that, but you, hear yourself deeply when you're being listened to. And when most of us aren't listened to today, most people haven't been, haven't developed the skill of listening. Listening is a skill. And a lot of people haven't spent that much time developing it. So that's part of why it's hard for us to find people who can really listen to us infrequently do people need advice frequently people need somebody to hear them so that they can organize their own thoughts and see what and where they need to pivot for themselves so i think that is ultimately the difference doing it by yourself it's like a cacophony of noise in your head you're you're you can't see the forest for the trees but when you have somebody external whose agenda has been set by you they can reflect you back to you in a way that I don't know you can do by yourself. Absolutely. Um, and what, what's like a common trait that you see a lot with with uh, with traders? Like, is it is it like a an ego problem, greed? Like, so, you know, what, what gets traders like uh, stuck sometimes that they need to reach out to to, to you in general? Uh, I think what I'll speak to is that it's arguing with reality arguing with reality mm -hmm. yeah 
So reality is that the let's say a trade is going against you, but you're fighting it, and that's the reality. You don't want to accept this, so, and there's a reason for that deep well, down inside, like uh, something going on outside of trading. It doesn't have to be deep down inside. It's because you wanted it to go another way. It, it doesn't have to be complicated. But every time something goes different than the way you prefer it, if you're arguing with that reality, you have to ask yourself what, look, reality is always going to win, uh-huh. right? And this is something I learned from Byron Katie's work. She says, reality only wins always. So we sort of are built to tell, I don't want this to happen. I don't like this to happen. This frustrates me. But what is it that creates humans to resist the reality that's in front of them? And and it's, I I. It could, we could spend a lot of time. Everybody's reasons for that probably would be different, but ultimately, it's irrelevant. What the what is informing that? What matters is that you get yourself back to accepting that that is what's so, and that if you begin to practice that technique over and over and over again, eventually you stop arguing with reality, and be learning how to accept it if not embrace it i see and what about like um okay so like a, a traders that don't trust themselves like uh you know like the one thing i've so I'm a, I'm a discretionary trader but there's also a lot of traders that are systematic traders and i've spoken to some that they just don't trust themselves that's so why they set all these rules almost like robotic so yeah. it follows it so is yeah. Is that just like knowing what they're, how they are, and that's the way they trade? Because there's very successful traders like that. As far as, yeah. you know, acknowledging wh- why you're like that, and, uh, you know, trying to get better at it. Just like, you know, as you know, they they just acknowledge it and make the rules like a robot and let it perform like a robot, yeah. rather than just like, dive deeper and correct it. I don't know. They said. I think there are different temperaments and personality types that go into trading. And I do think there is wisdom in recognizing that I I think it's, I, I wanna be very careful about that phrase that you used about not trusting themselves. They, it could be perceived as though they don't trust themselves, but it could be that they also are honest enough with themselves that uh-huh. they know when there's going to be a flood of emotion coursing through their veins they won't be able to respond in a neutral way that is preparing themselves for what is inevitable if you have a trade going against you and who isn't going to feel a sense of panic or urgency and it could be that they put those stops in place not because they don't trust themselves but because they do trust themselves to potentially move in the wrong direction it's like preparing yourself for the onslaught of the physiology that is inevitable there is a physiology happening behind the scenes all the time for us and when we get triggered we have to realize we are not going to operate from the place necessarily of our best interests because we are being triggered. So I think it comes down to being able to get clear on yourself. Look, there are people who drive in traffic and when somebody cuts them off, throws up the finger or screams at them without a pause right we've seen people like that and yet we have to ask ourselves is that the best way to handle somebody cutting you off in traffic but if that's what how you're built then that could be the kind of person who has to say wow is trading for me period or is am i going to have to do some work on myself to find out why i react ultimately 
the best traders are the ones who learn how to respond and not react. And if you are wanting to practice how to respond and not react, well, then it could be you need to put in stops to develop yourself over time. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you mentioned that. So like with me, for example, uh, before the podcast started, I was, I, was, I, I was telling you, oh, yeah, everything's cool. I have this new network of people and friends and like, my life is, is I, I love my life now. Um, as opposed to just just not too long ago, three years ago, four years ago, my life was a disaster. And um, when I started to get into trading and start putting all the work in and all that and, uh, and reading these books on psychology and listening to podcasts like yours and City Trade, uh, I said, you know, trading, one thing I love about trading is that if it forces you to change for to, for the, it's almost like staring at the mirror <laughs> because you got to fix yourself inside if you want to you have some success at this got it so you so like it. um i i found myself asking myself like for example if someone's cutting me off in traffic or even yesterday uh, for example someone was bumped me while walking really fast and then like i i kind of flinched and stood aside and a person like looked back and laughed at me so oh, you're 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 scared ha ah, you're scared of me like and and it was and like in the past i would have probably said something back yeah. or or like if someone cuts me off, I might, you know, but these days I find myself asking, even like when I first started to get profitable, I used to really reflect on those situations and be like, is, is me reacting going to help me become a better trader? I wanted to become a good trader so bad or just to get profitable so bad. I was like, every day in my life, even the guy that cut me off, I said, you know what, if I react right here, is that going to make me better? at what my goals are you know like if i yell at him if i react mm -hmm. if i get angry what, because what if it because like when i go to trade and the trade goes against me it's it's, it's almost like trading is like reflects your life almost it's, you it know? is it's the best school of consciousness the best school of how to wake up that that there could be because it's a game that never ends just like life so it forces everyone to be with what is going on within them. It is forcing everybody to see what are they attached to? Are they attached to the title of I'm a trader? Like I'm a successful trader, I'm a profitable trader. Like this is all the ego. Like it's it's the best school of, and the, and the market, man. Like what is what does JJ have? VWAP trader has on oh, his yeah. <laughs> handle. We're all one. Uh, what does it say? One trade away from humility. Yes. Like, yeah. And ultimately that that hubris is, you know, hubris is informed by somebody not really seeing their value, not seeing their worthiness. And so a lot of traders think that this label is going to finally earn them self-respect or respect from others. But nobody can give that to you, not your trading account. Only you can give that sense to yourself. Knowing you're worthy, regardless, is an inside job. Because having work with those on the other side of all that financial success, guess what? If you don't know that on the inside, it doesn't matter how much is in your bank account. It doesn't matter what the titles are. Doesn't matter the accolades that exterior world gives you. If you deep down inside don't feel you're worthy, none of that stuff is going to make you feel it. Wow. Um, so, so with that said, like for example, sometimes, uh, you know, now it's a lot easier. But I remember, like uh, a year ago or two years ago, when I have a red day, I would feel so, so bad, almost like 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 worthless <laughs> and then you know it's like and then you know over time i got I, through data and stuff i felt like okay i had two red days it's kind of normal i kept it within the range i traded i followed the rules this and that but like why why do sometimes traders feel even though it's not that much money um that you lose it's just the fact that you lost it, it's like tying your worth to the trade and what's the solution for that the, the solution is complex. The solution is that you have to start to investigate what is it about your sense of identity that you are putting it 
attaching it to and this is especially true for men men have been taught and and culturally it's just it's just physiology again biology thousands of years of conditioning them being able to succeed at their day job which way back when was you know just killing beasts on the serengeti so that they could eat that was it going to be collapsed with their sense of identity and and right now even test testosterone levels for men decline so part of the reason those days that are when they lose so the days when a trader does lose you do have a dip in your testosterone you are not going to feel so good and so you have to start the work of beginning to even though you may want to say to yourself okay this is not who i am you you're going to have to deal with the physiology of your body experiencing it as if it is something really dramatically wrong and being able to mitigate that know that but from the start oh i'm probably not going to be in a great space uh as i walk out away from my trading test today because I lost. That can at least allow you to begin to prepare for it. And maybe there's things you can do to get your testosterone levels raised after a lousy day so that it can happen organically. I'm not a big fan of taking a supplement of it because there's a lot of side effects that men don't really you know, pay attention to. But I think you, one has to realize that what you do is not who you are. And I know that sounds probably touchy feely to maybe some people listening, but that to me is a pretty critical piece. Um, if you do, if you do collapse your identity with what you do, uh, you, you're missing a huge chunk of who who and what you are. And I would just I just hate for people to do that because because I've seen those people on the other side of that uh, and that sense of true satisfaction fulfillment equanimity is not reached when that those things tell you who you are wow good stuff so um and how do you go about evaluating a trader like to see what needs to be worked on well traders reach out to my firm if they're interested in working with me or a coach on my team uh they usually self-select they say look i want to work with a coach now i've been thinking about it or putting it off we give them uh two things at intake when they sign on we have a specialized trader uh, positioning index which is an assessment that's very powerful it's uh really like a x-ray or dna of their judgments we feel so much uh about traders part of the challenges they face is whether they whether they have good judgment so this assessment helps traders really be able to see the the internal of how they make their judgments uh professionally and personally because of course they're connected who, who we are personally informs our work. So that's part of what I say to traders too, who are hesitant to do coaching. You think that you can be who you are trading as though that's separate than who you are day to day, but you can because who you are personally, how you have developed over time personally informs how you work, the vision that you are looking through your eyes are informed by your beliefs about yourself the stories you tell yourself are those stories uh we we are storytellers we you know in in Werner Erhard one of my teachers says we are meaning making machines again if we go back to the arguing with reality we're always coming up with a story right and that's just how humans are built but the key is being able to investigate what those stories are and looking at them in the eyes and not being just taken away by them so the first thing we do is our index we have this specifically set up because we know traders really need to know this about themselves and we also have a discovery packet which allows a trader to really see and create and answer questions about what do they truly want what is their code what is their trading in service to 
uh, sometimes people jump in without really thinking it through the commitment that it's going to ask the time it's going to ask the shifting potentially of, of your approach as the market is the market over time it has ups and downs ebbs and flows knowing how you're going to navigate all that some people don't really think that stuff through so that's what happens when somebody comes to us yeah awesome wow that's good insight right there okay so how can people find you to start to wrap this up okay so you have the podcast you have your book i'm going to have in the notes are, are are you working on a new book too i think you mentioned before in the last podcast you were well, working on a, I have a handful of ebooks but i'm going to gift your audience uh, a free copy of traderdiscipline.com traderdiscipline.com is uh it's about 22 pages free ebook talking about the importance of discipline how to turn up the volume on that so anybody listening goes to traderdiscipline.com please ca- get awesome. that free ebook I'll have that on the notes as well. And um, good stuff. Uh, and then what's your podcast called again? The Kim the Wall Street Curtain. Coach. The, the Wall, Wall Street, Street Coach. Coach. Yeah. Great. Cool. And uh, yeah, I'll link that the there rep- as well. And then the website is thewallstreetcoach.com. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks, Kim, for taking the time out. It's great to catch up with you and to speak well, with you once again. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you for having me on. Aloha. Thanks, Kim. We'll keep in touch. Bye. You bet.